Hi, everybody. Thanks for dropping in and uh, for practicing with us here in this community. And uh, for those that are joining joining us later on YouTube, uh, we hope you feel as much a part of this circle as, as I do, as we do, hopefully. Uh, the title, if, if these talks have a title, which they usually do, just so people can find them, uh, of tonight's talk is on perspective. And this uh, is a rose for me because I was in Toronto this past weekend. And mm, had a few really great experiences, as one can do in Toronto, <laughs> among other varieties of experiences so and the the couple of these things kind of stood out as a, a theme in how they landed for me in just really giving a beautiful sense of perspective on life on the world on self etc uh and so um Put the links to these things down below in the YouTube recording and um, check them out if you're in that area, if you feel inclined. So the first one it took us a couple of days to get there because there was issues on, on their end. But anyways, it was it's a place called Little Canada and it's near the Eaton Centre in Toronto. It's kind of kitty corner across the street. Uh, little Canada and someone had told me about it otherwise I wouldn't have uh, never heard of it before uh, and it's it's hard to describe <laughs> but it's um, basically miniatures but there's lots of different sizes of miniatures if you know anyone that does like toy train collecting or you know that kind of setup there's different sizes and these ones like the people are maybe that big really they're very small they, I think it's the, I think it's the smallest that they make but I could be wrong about that so and they've made these huge is the word dioramas like a sculpture like replications of the whole um, the Golden Triangle is one whole area, like, and all the cities and the sites uh, in those areas, you know, they're, and they're kind of put together as one scene. Of course, Toronto has a whole bunch of space. And then there's Ottawa, Quebec, the East Coast, and they're working on the West Coast display um, now. So, oh, I wish I could show you the images. It's crazy. One of the things you can do there is this process they call littleization, where you go into this, I guess, three-dimensional camera booth, and they take a picture. You can go in, and then they make a little you that you can put into that display wherever you want to have it put or you know you can get different sizes of course the bigger they are the more expensive and more detailed and you can take them home and have have your little use <laughs> there's all kinds of if you do go just don't take it at first glance you have to it if you really look, you'll see all kinds of crazy stuff in there. They've had fun. And there's all kinds of little jokes and wacky things hidden amongst all these scenes. Like, a lot. Really fun. So maybe I'll, yeah, I'll just leave that there for now and come back to it. The second experience 
that we had on the weekend. Um, we were walking, but it was just like a block away from where we were staying uh, on Front Street. Yes, Front Street down near St. Lawrence Market area. Um, and it was just one of an infinite number of pot shops or what do they call it? Cannabis dispensary. Uh, but they just had like a sandwich board outside, but it said it was like the logo from Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon album, 50th anniversary, which made me feel super old. Um, which is an extraordinary album. And I've seen many concerts, but so someone standing outside said, oh, it's really great. Check it out. So we went in and there's like this dome. It's bigger than this room, but it's, and it has beanbag chairs in it. Maybe 12 people could fit in there, like not huge. And they project this, it's a 360 degree immersive experience of this incredible video and, and the soundtrack to Dark Side of the Moon. It's really good. It's really good. I want to go again. But part of that film, there's many parts to it, but a fair bit of it is this zooming out into space into the cosmos and and beyond and and seeing our galaxy and and then seeing all you know infinite galaxies and that kind of really big zooming out There's so much to describe about it, but so to me, these two experiences brought to mind the Dharma, you know, how do I get there, but um, of the relative and the absolute, which are really important. <laughs> they are concepts pointing to experiences in the Dharma. Um, I'll also put the Pali words for these um, down below, and maybe I'll mention them here just in case anybody likes to reference these things. So relative is Panyati, P-A-N-N-A-T-T-I, Panyati. And the absolute is the Pali word paramatha, paramatha, mata, P-A-R-A-M-A-T-T-H-A. -A -T -T so um, some people just like to Google these things and read more about them or reference them. You could also just look up relative and absolute in Buddhism and, and explore it a little bit more. So the relative truth is like all of this. <laughs> when is it's all the concepts, the perceptions, the naming, the seeing forms as being permanent and solid and me and mine and you and yours, and these um how we have concepts and names for everything. And it happens instantly from what we're taught and um, how we're acculturated, et cetera. And uh, in that relative truth, everything is quite dualistic because it's coming from a sense of me seeing that as soon as I name it and see it as bowl, singing bowl, there, it creates me here. And there's a sense of separation. That's that thing. This is me seeing that thing. It is a dualistic view of each other, the world, the things we want, the things we don't want. 
And to, and for me, that kind of was displayed in this little Canada. It's like this sense of place, you know, where I am, that's my city, or I've been there, or, um, you know, identification with different parts of culture that were displayed or place. There's this mm, sense of placing ourselves in, in our ancestry, in our lineage, in our, in our experiences. And that, and that can also create othering self and other. <clears throat> And the other Pink Floyd, they, there was much, much more to it than I'm describing. Um, I'm not sure how much longer that show is there, but if you're in Toronto, I would recommend checking it out. Uh, to me, it reminded me of, and it was just a reminding of the absolute truth of seeing ourselves as this tiny, not even speck in the absolute space or emptiness or vastness of the ultimate reality. Um, it's an experience that's beyond language and concepts. The experience of universal boundlessness, awake awareness, is also non-dual. Mm. There's not so much attachment to what's me and mine. It's like pff, blown out of the water. And there's... Um, different qualities in the in the experience of emptiness hmm. uh, language <laughs> from the truth of absolute awake awareness emptiness boundlessness Mm, we can even that gets in get self in there it gets hard to talk about but um there's a direct knowing of the truth the three characteristics of all things that all things are absolutely interrelated non-dual uh, that and because all things are absolutely interrelated, they're constantly inter inter are as Thich Nhat Hanh says, um, mm, affecting, affected, changing, not separate, permanent, isolated, stagnant, anything. And because all things are interconnected and constantly changing and affected by causes and conditions way beyond our control, way beyond, uh, there's nothing to be clung to. Uh, and we see the truth of dukkha, the truth of suffering, of which the cause of suffering is clinging, holding on to what's me and mine and pushing away what I don't want, etc. And I'm not sure if this concept holds but it's something I've been playing with today. I don't know. I think it makes sense. <laughs> if we 
kind of see a visual of like a horizontal experience. That kind of little Canada model is was like a, this horizontal view of place and things and all of that. That relative existence. And then a vertical line or a vertical experience that, that felt like this kind of zooming out into boundless uh, space. And what uh, intersects the axis of these vertical and horizontal truths is the body here and now in that cross, if there was a circle in the center of that, right now in this changing conditioned experience, it, we have the awareness and the faculties to be able to know both of these truths, relative and absolute. And Nagar, Nagarjuna, N-A-G-A-R-J-U-N-A, -A -A, Nagarjuna, I feel like I'm pronouncing it incorrectly, Buddhist monk and philosopher from the 2nd and 3rd century CE, um, said it this way, translated by J. Garfield, how these two truths are inter are and are both helpful he says this way without a foundation in conventional truth the significance of the ultimate cannot be taught and without understanding the significance of the ultimate liberation is not achieved <laughs> Without a foundation in conventional truth, relative truth, uh, the significance of the ultimate cannot be taught, the ultimate or the absolute. And without understanding the significance of the ultimate, liberation is not achieved. Hmm. So both to to just be like uh, caught in absolute truth, like ah, there is no self and uh, it's all impermanent and is is just another form of spiritual bypassing. There is uh, anatta doesn't say there is no self. It's to understand mm, the, the, the uh, a more accurate translation is not self, not no self, not self. It's to see through what is perceived as being permanent, separate, ongoing self. And to, to see that, you know, if you pinch me, I feel it. You don't feel it. <laughs> There is this, this self, but seeing through it as um, that, to see its true nature and characteristics. So both of these relative and absolute truths inter are, are both important to see and understand and be able to uh, see clearly with wisdom. <laughs> when I was on a three month retreat, it was um, Guy Armstrong made reference in one of his Dharma talks to this poem by Rumi. And uh, I, it, it, in particular, he referenced an excerpt from this poem that I'll link down below. Uh, and I I uh, learned that poem by heart, and it served me deeply 
on that retreat, like really, you know, when things get tough, that poem just kept me, it was a real, what's the word, guide post and, uh, well, yeah, super helpful. <laughs> having trouble with the words tonight. So I'll share this excerpt that um, I learned by heart that was super helpful to me. It's, it's really got a lot in it. This is from Jaludin Rumi. Mm. Live in the nowhere that you came from. That's already just says it all. Even though you have an address here. Oh, live in the nowhere that you came from, even though you have an address here. That's why you see things in two ways. Sometimes you look at a person and see a cynical snake. Someone else sees a joyful lover and you're both right. Everyone is half and half like the black and white ox. You have eyes that see from nowhere and eyes that judge distances, how high and how low. You own two shops and you run back and forth. Try to close the one that's a fearful trap, getting always smaller. Checkmate this way, checkmate that. Keep open the shop where you're not selling fish hooks anymore. You are the free swimming fish. Oh man, that's so helpful to feel, to know when we're in the shop that's a fearful trap, always getting smaller. Checkmate this way, checkmate that. Just to know. And, and then we can choose to close that shop and keep open the shop where you're not selling fish hooks anymore. You're not getting hooked. You're not biting the hook. You're not trying to hook what you want, hook other people. And how we have eyes that see from that nowhere and eyes that judge distances. To me, it's really a poem about this relative and absolute. And to know, <laughs> just it's liberating to just know when you're stuck in just seeing things as being, it's like this and it's like that, and we're kind of down in the little, littleization we're, you know, there's no perspective, there's no clarity, we're just like down there. Oh. I'm just can really picture it. Um, and as soon as that is known, when we know we're hooked, or we know we're in, we can feel when we're in a contracted state of mind, body, heart, right then, just in the knowing, there's some space from it. But also in the knowing, there's a choice. To close this shop, to open the other shop. And hmm, practice some spacious awareness. This is one of the things that Guy Armstrong taught on that three-month retreat that was So awesome. He teaches a lot on emptiness. It's super helpful, as well as all the Dharma. But uh, yeah, <laughs> to have, we've all had these direct experiences or glimpses of boundless awake aware awareness. And it has certain qualities, which is one of the ways you can recognizing can be known. 
It has the qualities of the four Brahmaviharas, which are boundless, boundless loving kindness, boundless resonant joy, boundless compassion, and boundless equanimity. Seeing, no, seeing isn't the word, knowing <laughs> all the infinite boundless heartaches and joys and feeling that loving compassion, but also having equanimity am amidst these waves. And this is part of the qualities of what's called emptiness, which is a confusing label. Label Emptiness is not really empty. It's empty of separate self. Hmm. Okay. So check out Little Canada and Pink Floyd. <laughs> See what you think. <laughs> different kind of dharma than the Buddha and Nagarjuna maybe we're imagining, but maybe not. Maybe not. Hmm. So we can we can practice this way. So let's do that. Let's have a practice now. Well, we'll uh, touch into these relative and absolute truths, perhaps. Okay, so adjust your your space and uh, anything you need to be comfortable and awake and upright. If you need any adjustments in your lighting, some people like to turn away from the computer or... Uh, Whatever you need. Take some time to adjust your space. Hmm. <clears throat> and allow yourself some time to settle. See if you need any stretch or movement or looking around. Any touch? <clears throat> uh, so that the body naturally comes to a place of rest. Whether you're sitting or reclining, standing or even walking, there's a sense of landing, letting go of other distractions, coming to rest. And then feel where the eyes want to rest. Is it supportive for you to close the eyes or to just rest them downward with a bit of light coming in? Sometimes that can help with wakefulness. Some people might find it helpful to just let the eyes rest on gazing out a window into spacious view. See if it's helpful to have any sighing breaths. For some, it might be helpful to imagine the muscles of the face as if you're just starting to lay down for a nap and feel all the tension in the muscles of the face just soften and drape 
So the eyes rest back and the forehead becomes wide. The lower jawbone feels its weight. As the face relaxes, feel the sides and back of the neck lengthen. And the weight of the shoulders slides down away from the earlobes. Down through the elbows and into relaxed hands. Receptive and relaxed hands. And let some attention remind you of the back of the body. Resting back and down. Supported by the spine so that the space of the heart center and the belly center could soften, widen. And feel this weight and contact and touch of the body through the hips, the legs, the feet, or the back of the body, meeting this ground. And fully knowing this relative experience, the body here and now like this, in this place, in this space, with these experiences, this sense of history or ancestry, etc. These concepts of language and place this these identities of who we might say we are these roles that we move through in our days, our relationships. And we need to have this experience of these conventional relative truth. These sense doors that give us this capacity to know our world. From this place, we also have the capacity to directly experience and know the ultimate truth. And 
one way that we might be able to access this, there's many, is to just let attention move back through the back of the body and feel the space behind you. Feel the space in front, perhaps just to a wall that's in front of you or an object in front of you without even needing to look at it. You can feel proprioception, this experience of the space that's in front of you and behind. Side to side, above and below. Just let the field of awareness expand into the space of the room that you're in. And see that you don't, how much effort is needed. You don't need to push the awareness into that space or try hard. Let's just uh, like a drop in a pond rippling out. Just let the attention move in all these directions and be a bit wider. And then at some point, there may be a sound from some other part of the space you're in, perhaps outside of the room or outside of a window or even the sound of my voice. And instantly, that space expands to include this perception of where that sound is coming from. Or there might be a scent coming from some other space in the house or where you are. It could even just be the thought, thinking of a tree that is outside the space. And awareness is instantly expanded. Seeing, thinking of, hearing an airplane. Or a vehicle moving by further away. If that feels too large, you can just keep practicing in the space in your room or just the space in front of you and just really get a sense of how that feels is known differently than just feeling the touch of your hand on your lap.
Awake awareness is boundless. Compassionate, kind, equanimous. If the mind has swept into distractedness or restlessness, just gently gather back into this relative truth. Feel the touch of the ground, relaxing the body, perhaps resting with a few breaths. And then after a time, you could gently explore again, expand, open, widen. And whichever relative or absolute experiences being known, it all has the characteristics of being not me and mine, not permanent, and not to be clung to. Live in the nowhere that you came from, even though you have an address here. Without a foundation in conventional truth, the significance of the ultimate cannot be taught.
without understanding the significance of the ultimate, liberation is not achieved. What is the felt experience of abiding, resting, expanding awareness right at this axis of relative and absolute, or this axis of horizontal and vertical truth? And can you feel some sense of equanimity in this axis, this embodied moment, touching into relative and absolute truth? Boundless compassion, boundless equanimity. Marcel Proust said the real voyage of discovery 
consists not in seeking out new landscapes, but in having new eyes. Having perspective to see true nature. I'll also put a link down below and for folks in the Zoom room here of a, is something I recalled seeing many moons ago, um, a little video um, on YouTube. How long is this one? Yeah, three minutes. Um, hmm, where they zoom out from a person lying on the earth out into the astrosphere and then it goes very quickly like the uh, Pink Floyd thing's better <laughs> and then it comes all the way back in and then in through the eye and into the microcosm of this universe inside this form you know same same it's really uh it's another perhaps inspiring image that might give some perspective hmm. all right yes thanks for joining us in this practice i hope there's something uh curious or fruitful for you there be good to you.